So if all the power goes out today, it's because they got a bunch of waffle irons. Is that what they're called? Or whatever they're called. Uh, uh, making up some waffles for you. So <clears throat> I'll just yell loud if the, well, yell loud, that would be the same word there. Uh, uh, you'll be able to hear me nonetheless. But anyway, I am Juno, and it's good that you are here. And again, thanks whether you're joining us uh, by streaming or by actually uh, being here. For those of you who have paused your, your TVs and recorded the March Madness, thank you for doing that. For those of you at home watching it, you're forgiven. We'll talk about that a little later in the subject. But uh, I'm glad that, that you are here as we continue uh, to talk about the idea of darkness to light. And that is our theme as we both remember and prepare our hearts uh, for Easter Sunday. The idea from darkness uh, to light. And so today we are going to be looking at a passage in, in 1 John that's in the, in the New Testament. Uh, if you want to grab those Bibles and, and, and get ahead a little bit, uh, that's on page 855. And we are really going to be talking uh, about the idea of love as well as how does forgiveness intertwine uh, with that. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your people here. Thank you that uh, they have been intentional to join us, whether it's uh, by streaming, whether it's by showing up. You know, as we, as we look at your command uh, to love, Lord, uh, we do know that it's fueled by forgiveness. So I simply pray uh, that our minds and that our hearts are open to the movement of your spirit and that you will rule over our thoughts. In fact, that you will change, that you will transform some of our thoughts around that idea of both love and forgiveness. So may what, what people are thinking, uh, may those thoughts and may the words that come from my mouth uh, be acceptable in your sight because you really are our strength, our redeemer, you are the author of forgiveness. And so just help us as we uh, dive into that subject this morning uh, to, to apply that to our lives wherever it needs to be. In your name, amen. And so as I mentioned, we're going to be, be really focusing on a portion from, from 1 John uh, this morning as you talk about uh, really love and then the idea of forgiveness. And that's just not because we want to talk about it, but that's because that's what John is diving into. And that is uh, a part of our theme as I read this passage that you're going to see that John is also talking heavily about moving uh, from darkness uh, to light. And he compares that with the idea uh, of love. And so again, just to get an, an understanding here, you know, uh, John is, is writing this, this book uh, to some folks, some folks who have been hurt, to some folks who uh, just are not in a good place because of some, some heretics, so to speak, some false teachers, maybe a, a better word that, that you can understand. And so in, in some of our terms, you know, these people, People who believe in Jesus are basically licking their wounds and, and trying to figure out what happened. This false teaching that was going on had done a number on the local church and had really split the church. And so uh, John was writing uh, to, to some folks there, but other uh, scholars are saying that, you know, he's really addressing this to more than just one church, but to many churches. And I think as we dive into this a little bit more, you're going to see how it really applies uh, to not just our church, but uh, local churches and the church with a big C uh, around the world. It is just uh, uh, an interesting subject, the idea of love. We hear about it. We write about it. You write cards. You sign probably, not every card, not when you pay your bills, you know, but you, you sign many letters with love. And so let's just uh, take a look at what John is talking about in First John. It's it's First John uh, chapter two, and I'm going to read verses uh, seven and eight. I think it's seven and eight for you to begin with. Uh, let me read those for you. Well, I'll look up here and I can 
see it better. It's far enough away that I don't need my glasses uh, when I'm looking at that screen. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. It's truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. And so as we look at that, folks, uh, the idea is, I just want to say as I read that and studied this, like, come on, John, is it new or is it old? You know, are you talking out of both sides of your mouth here? What's going on? And, and let me just put it this way. Uh, let me see a show of hands. How many of you have ever bought a used car? Let me see your hands. Good, many of us. Okay. It's easier for me to buy a new one because I don't, I won't say I don't trust used car salesmen. But anyway, uh, it's, it's a difficult task. Okay. So you finally get this, used, this new car and you say to all your friends, hey, I got a new car. And they're like, great, wonderful. Finally, you get a new car. And then you have to backpedal because you're like, well, it's, it's new to me, but it's really used. You know, I mean, we've been there before uh, on when we've bought in that new car, which is really a used car. And that's really what John is trying to, to get through here as we are, uh, what's it called? As we are, are wrestling even with what he's talking about, new, old. And so I'm going to take the help of a couple more verses uh, in Scripture. One of them is Leviticus 19.18. And that, again, is on page 81 in those Bibles uh, in your chair backs. And again, this is from the, uh, some would call it uh, the First Testament. Some would call it the Pentateuch, meaning the first five books of the Bible. It's really the fourth of those five books. But understand that, that really the people in, in our story, uh, this is the only scripture they've had uh, was that first five books of the Old Testament. And so I am going to be uh, just, just reading to you Levit Leviticus uh, 19, 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now those words, love your neighbor as, our, uh, as yourself, really do resonate because we've all heard that. And we mostly tie that into the New Testament, which we're going to look at. And that's going to be John 13, 34 and 35, which is page 751. And very familiar words to us. A new command. I, well, is it a new command? Because it's really back in Levit Leviticus, but he's saying, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so John was, again, he was talking to hurting people. He was talking to people who had been, been beat up by, by false teachers of the church. And he circles back around what uh, a subject that is familiar to us all, and that is of love. And John is confident that the people can do that, that the people, despite what has gone on in their life, that they're going to be able to, to, to love one another and work through this challenge. And, and John is confident that they can do that because that love comes uh, from God. And again, in their culture, darkness and light, darkness is often referred to in the sense of evil, bad spirits, you know, not good. And light is referred to uh, as God or as something that is good and that brings life. And so in the context of what John is writing uh, to his people, again, he is just saying uh, that you are going to be able to, to, to conquer this and to move from uh, darkness to light and to not let the darkness overcome the light. And that's easy for us to do today. It is way too easy for us to let the darkness overcome the light. So let me get into our passage here. It's, uh, again, it is uh, 1 John uh, chapter 2. 
Uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to go now to verses 9 through 11, again, where John basically uh, is, is, is speaking the truth about this, this, this word love that we throw around and use like it's no big deal. 9 and 10, anyone who claims to be the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness that they do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. And then 12, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. But let's focus in here on verses 9 uh, through, through 11, folks. And that, again, uh, the love that John is talking about is the, is the, is the deepest love. We know that, that, that Scripture talks about love in some different ways. And this is the sacrificial. This is the love that I will do, I'll put you in front of myself. I will do for you uh, things that will help you, but it's really an inconvenience for me. So he's not just talking about uh, uh, putting up with, trust me, been there, where you just put up with somebody, whether it's a family member, an in-law, and I have great in-laws, so it's not me I'm talking about here, but I know it is just uh, easy and life is difficult, and at times, the, the most you can do, the, uh, the, the st only strength that you can muster up is to put up with versus to have that sacrificial love. And, and this is what John is talking to the church about. You know, I could have uh, glossed, we could gloss over this uh, in, in many ways, trust me. But yet John is talking about the sacrificial love that Jesus had is what we need to have uh, for one another. In fact, that's the twist that John is, is, is making here is that uh, this new commandment, uh, the idea of, of loving others was, was pretty common. But then it's changed to we love one another. Not just those outside of the church, but those inside the church, those are part of the church family that we need to love one another. And so that's where, where John adds the twist to the commandment that, that makes a, a new commandment that we really need to love one another. And again, John doesn't pussyfoot around with that term love. He is going to the, to the heart of it that it is that sacrificial love that Jesus had for us that we need to have for one another. And, and I know that uh, uh, we can, again, we can whitewash this. We can think it's, it's it, no, it's, it's not quite that, but, but just think through the people who you know that don't love Jesus or you know who don't come into a church and often they're going to say it's because we're hypocrites and often that has to deal with that they just don't feel the love. And some of that, and let's take ownership, folks, some of that is because they have heard you, and let me talk in a, not just you as new life, but church in, a, in the broader sense. You know, people go back to the office and they talk about Sunday and they complain about this or that, and other people are really listening. You know, on your way home, you and your spouse, you talk about what you like or didn't like, and yet your kids are listening. You go to the family function and how's church and, and you talk about things that have absolutely nothing to do with eternity. And then you wonder why Aunt Sue wants nothing to do with the church because all she hears from you is rah, 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 rah. They're just, not, they're just not hearing, they're not seeing, they're not feeling the love that John is calling us to. And trust me, been there, that it is just easier to put some people at arm's length than it is to resolve some things and work through uh, the command to really love one another and not to let the darkness come in. And, and that, you know, it's like, as I was working through this fact, I had to write the sermon twice. 
because I got it done. I went back to correct my opening line and I couldn't find it in the computer. And the good news is I did not need to go to confession about what I thought about my computer when I could not find that sermon. So I had to rewrite the entire thing. Uh, and, uh, but I am changing the software company that supposedly stores my sermons. Uh, but anyway, as I was, again, was thinking through this, it's like, okay, Lord, what is it that, uh, why is it? What is it, why is it that we just can't love one another? How come it's so easy for the outsiders to look through us and to know eh, something isn't right? And could it be as simple, people, as simple as, you know, the, the, the things we have talked about and the things that, that we read is that, you know, you just don't talk about other people. You don't gossip about other people. You don't whine and complain about other people uh, versus going and actually trying to resolve the problem. And I just still think, and I'm, I could be naive, and I know I have a higher expectation for the church, I will uh, admit that that if any organization needs to be, uh, have a higher calling, I just feel it's us as the church. And why? Because we love Jesus, the guy that gave it all for us, the guy that has forgiven us. And he definitely gives us some insights as to how to keep these relationships moving in some wonderful ways. And, and, and the thing is, as, as I was writing it for the second time, it's like, and it's not just for the church. Because I'm guessing as you think through your own relationships and when there's been breakdown or if there's been breakdown uh, or, you know, relationships that are just in the tank, it's probably because of some of those basic things that, that I just shared. And so again, John is calling us to, to love one another. And, you know, and, and, you know, basically I just want to say, John just wants to say, stop it. Just stop. No, with you with kids, and I only had one child, and I know I've caught myself more. I just want to say, stop. End of conversation. Listen to me. I know that's probably not your best parenting tips, but that's what we do at times as parents. You used to say, stop. Stop the arguing. And maybe the Lord knew I could not handle more than one child. But as I, as I have seen, bless Ryan and Hartley with their little twins, in Judea, but it's like, you got all this commotion and stuff, and no, I, I, this is not them talking. It, it's just like, at times, don't you just want to say, stop, listen to mom and dad, play together well, you know, and so I just think John is up to something, and I have just interpreted that to us, to us as a church, to you and your relationships, and to your marriages, and to things with your own kids, whether they're grandkids or adult kids, Sometimes we just need to hear the word stop. Figure it out. Work it out. Again, we're, you, we're in a season not of Lent. We're in a season of numerous funerals here at the church. And when somebody's in the casket, that is the last, and it's almost too late just to say stop. And the guilt that goes on with people is because they haven't resolved issues they haven't cleared up those conversations. They haven't made things right before their loved one passed away. And so it's like, let's, let's be ahead of the game, folks. Let's not wait until your loved one dies or a member of the church dies. And you're thinking, yeah, I knew I should have cleared this up. And he or she was never happy with this. And, you know, again, John's not just talking about differences. Because differences are normal. Differences are healthy. Differences help us to all grow and learn to appreciate one another. And so John's not talking about differences. He's just talking about those places where you're just like, you avoid them, you ignore them, you despise them, you don't want nothing to do with them. And yet these are the same people we're going to spend eternity with. So maybe a good idea to start working on that now so that in eternity it's going to be, I don't know how God's going to handle that 
Because there'd be a lot of people up there that haven't uh, cleared the air before they entered into eternity. But let's take advantage of our time here. And as John is telling us to, to really, uh, to love one another. And if we look at, again, John uh, 13, 35, I, I read it earlier. And why? And why? It's so that people will know that we are disciples of Jesus so that they can be brought into the fold, so to speak, so that they can lower their defenses and their, and their concerns and that just maybe, just maybe, they'll walk through the door with you one day and, and go, oh, I guess it isn't that bad. Oh, all churches aren't fill in the blank. And so it is really, the way we get along is going to be, is going to be exhibited out there uh, to the world. And it's really so that they will know that Jesus is real. And so, uh, again, uh, let's bring up verse 12 again that I read earlier. John, John is saying, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. And so this passage, I feel, is talking about love, some difficult uh, commands to love one another. And the second area is that I think it is built on this word, uh, for, oh, it's gone, but it's in there, <laughs> forgiven. And I think it's easy for me to just to blow past that word because it's a spiritual word. Most of you know what it means. Even if you've never spent a minute in a church, you know what it means Cognitively, you may know what it means to forgive. And so, yet, you know, I could have just wrapped up this and we would have been having uh, waffles a half hour early today. But yet it's one of those words that I just think there are, it's a trigger word for us. It's a word that really, uh, that is the consequence of, of God's love and sacrifice that, that we have been forgiven and so it is what our found, it's the foundation of our belief system tied in with the love that, we, that, that God has for us. But yet I wanted just to focus on it because I still think for many of us, it is a, it's a trigger word. It's a hot button. It's something that we, we really, some of you are probably now closing up your mind and your heart to know that isn't going to happen. He's a blankety blank. She's a rotten this. And, you know, they did this. He did this. Nope, nope, nope. Not going there. Not going there. Take me to the waffles. I'm done. <laughs> and so I have the, the pleasure of, of just talking about uh, forgiveness uh, a little bit deeper here. Okay, uh, again, why forgiveness? Because I think it's, it's a part of, of the silver bullet. You know, churches and organizations across the world are looking for the silver bullet. Like, what's going to make the church grow? What's going to make my organization grow? What's going to make my company uh, turn from the red to the black? What's going to put us on the charts? Everyone's looking for that silver, silver bullet. And yet, as I read John... I think the silver bullet is love, authentic, self-sacrificing love like Jesus had. That is the silver bullet for the church. Yeah, we're not going to agree on some stuff. Yeah, you're going to disagree with your spouse. But uh, trust me, your friends, your, your children's friends, your grandkids will know you love one another when your love is authentic. Even when stuff hits the fan once in a while at grandma and grandpa's house. Even though you have disagreements with your spouse, they're going to know that something's different with mom and dad, and it's because they love Jesus. And so that is going to be the foundation, and that is the legacy of so many of you here who are older than me, uh, that you're leaving for your family is that you have, uh, because of the love of Christ in you, changing your heart, helping you to forgive, that you've been able to leave that legacy with your children. And so again, 
uh, it is, it, forgiveness is foundational uh, to each and every one of us who have opened our hearts to Jesus. That is, that is why Jesus went to the cross, so that we would be forgiven. And while that's, again, a nice Sunday sermon conclusion right there, John is reminding us uh, that we need to practice forgiveness so that we can genuinely love one another. And so, I, again, I think it's a, a trigger word. And, again, it's a trigger wor- word, forgiveness, because you're all in relationship with somebody, your spouse, your friends, the people at work, the in-laws, the outlaws, the grandkids. You are in relationship with somebody. So either you've ticked them off, and you have, or they've ticked you off, and they've hurt you, and they have. And so you've got to deal with forgiveness. Some way and somehow, let's not put it under the carpet. And if, you know, the idea of under the carpet, you know, it's dark under the carpet. And weird things happen under the carpet. And if you've ever lifted some carpet that's been there, you know that, you, what is that? And I think we at times have maybe put our faith or the, some elements of our faith that we're uncomfortable with under the carpet or the sin or the hurt the legitimate hurt that's been given to us, we've shoved it under the carpet so that we don't have to deal with it. But yet something is there that needs to be dealt with. Uh, so uh, Ken Snade, I think uh, that's how you pronounce his last name. He's the author of uh, Peacemaker. Uh, it's a guide uh, to uh, resolving personal conflict. And he talks about this idea of forgiveness. And I think it's a, it's a hot button for some of us Some of us want to really shove it under the carpet because we uh, don't fully understand it. So I had this file. It is is almost 30 years old, a a, a hard file. That means for some of you it's with paper. It's in a cabinet. It's not electronic uh, on forgiveness. And this is uh, one of the articles in there. And so to help us unpack that term forgiveness, I need to, again, take you to two passages. One of them is in the the Old Testament, Numbers 5, 6, and 7. I think we have it. Yes, we do. Okay. Say to the Israelites, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. Here's the part we ignore or haven't been taught. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done. Add a fifth to the value to it and give it, to all, uh, give it all to the person they have wronged. And then we have in the New Testament, Luke 19, 8. Uh, uh, but Zacharias stood up and said to the Lord, uh, Lord, look, here and now I give, give, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And so here we have the idea of restitution. Now, if any of you ever owe the IRS some money, they, they're claiming these verses. Trust me. No, I haven't yet. Thank God. Uh, but you always hate those little envelopes when you get them from the IRS. Uh, because if, if you owe them back money, I mean, you, it is, it's not cheap. It's probably more than four or five times the amount. or It, it is just horrible. But anyway, going back to our, our passage here, the idea, uh, I was working on taxes yesterday, the idea of, of restitution. See, I think many of us think forgiveness does not include restitution. And so there, we've been hurt. We've been offended. We have legitimately been the victim of a situation. And there's been no restitution. Now, Ken, in his writing, uh, he breaks this up in a number of ways. He says, really, forgiveness is a two-part 
It's, it's a cycle, but there's two parts to it. And this is, I think, hopefully very freeing for, for many of us. Uh, the, the first is the idea that, uh, that, and that we have heard before, and he calls it uh, positional forgiveness. Now, again, as I kept reading this, it's like, now, he's not making a mountain out of a molehill. But he's trying to unpack this word forgiveness so that we can understand it, so that we can practice it. Uh, it's really, it's, it's uh, maybe uh, the first part of this equation. Uh, I think we have it down well, this, this, this positional forgiveness. You know, somebody offends you, your daughter-in-law, your, your husband, your, your kids, a friend, and you confront them and you have this conversation. And there's a legitimate, you know, I, I'm sorry. I did not mean it that way. Or, and there's a legitimate uh, remorse and a changing and, and, and the relationship is good. Uh, that's uh, propositional. That's positional, I'm sorry. Positional forgiveness. It's also uh, the, the type where, where maybe if you can't talk with somebody, Maybe they are deceased. Maybe they have moved away. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a legal thing uh, and there's a restraining order and you can't go to that person. Really, this is positional is, is really uh, the idea of forgiveness that many of us go to in the sense of, you're right, he or she will never say, I'm sorry. They will never uh, bring restitution to the situation that they caused. You may never see them again and never talk to them. But it's at that point, this is maybe where many of us get stuck, is that you still need to say, okay, God, I'm hurt. I'm deeply hurt. For some of you, that whatever has happened will be with you for the rest of your life. And I'm angry. This never should have happened. And Lord, you need to take this from me. I do want to forgive them. I don't feel like I want to forgive them. But I know it is better for me to forgive. And based on, on the love of Christ for us, we're all screw-ups. We've all done something and continue to do stuff. But Jesus forgives us. So, so Lord, take Take this from my heart. And if you promise not to sing the words, I really want to say you need to let it go. Let it go. Amen. Amen. And we need to do that more often than not for even the same situation. Because you can let it go, let it go, but six months later something comes up and you're just like, you need to let it go. Say, Lord, here it is again. I don't like it. I'm angry again. Be honest with God. God really knows what's going on anyway. But it helps you to process that and say, take it. Let it go. Let it go. So that is really positional forgiveness. But the cycle of forgiveness really needs to be uh, what, what uh, Ken calls transactional forgiveness. It is really what we talked about in the, in the passages about restitution happening. And it's the second stage, and it's, it's the idea where there's been repentance, and when, when, when needs to be, there needs to be restitution. And for some of us, that's where we get hung up a little bit. Because we're saying, without the restitution, I can't forgive you. And yet Jesus says, no, you still need to forgive them. They're the ones that are going to suffer from not making the restitution. They will live their lives uh, whatever way they are going to uh, because they have not really received the full act of forgiveness. And I just think often uh, we don't like forgiveness because we think more, we think more of, the, of the transactional, well, he or she did this, you know, and they're not saying they're sorry and they're a creep and they are a creep. Jesus loves them, but from human standards, they're a creep. Okay, they're still a creep. And yet, I can't forgive them. Do you understand what they did? What they said? 
how they ran my name uh, uh, through the dirt, and now I'm supposed to forgive them. That's when we go back again to positional, where you just say, Lord, take it and let it go. We can't control the past. We can control how we respond to those situations. It's, it is not easy, and it occurs over and over. But it really comes back to the forgiveness that, that we have received. And the humility to know that, yeah, you know, I'm not perfect. I don't have it together. These things do happen. Uh, I am not the saint. Even though I'm saved by grace, I am not a saint, a pure, nothing, I never do anything wrong. Because that would be impossible. As we lean into that fact that we've been forgiven, it really does help us to understand, okay, Lord, while I don't think he deserves it, I don't think uh, it is not in me, you need to take it, Lord. And that is the key. Because I can't forgive. But because of Jesus, I can. I really can't love people enough. But, but because of Jesus in me, that helps me to love others and to understand love in a way that I probably never would have understood. And it doesn't always mean that everything's going to be hunky-dory with the person who is the offender. But it means you've let it go, take it, Jesus. And that may be your, your theme for a while about some issues, uh, some deep-seated, rooted issues. But it shouldn't be the issues about, oh, they planted red flowers instead of white ones at the church. That just ticks me off. What do they think they're doing? Now, again, no one's, com- I don't think they have. No one's complained to us about that, and we don't even have, I don't think, red flowers. anyway. That's the example, folks, is that don't let it, uh, uh, don't let the little things turn into the big things. And so we just need to wrap up with, with understanding forgiveness because as the band comes back out here, or the worship team, depending on what word you're more comfortable with. Uh, and by the way, the ending songs are incredible. I've listened to them uh, during the rehearsal, and it's like, I just need a CD of, those, of these last three songs. But anyway, let's just look a little bit about uh, forgiveness, because I do think that we're reluctant to forgive because we really don't understand what it is. You know, forgiveness, take a, you know, forgiveness is not excusing somebody. It's not saying, well, with their background, no wonder they acted that way. Forgiveness still holds people accountable for their actions. Forgiveness is not forgetting. And I've mentioned that, you know, it's something, you know, uh, our minds are going to bring up some stuff at the weirdest times. And you're going to think, oh, I've worked through that. And you have, but you're going to have to work through it again. Because, you know, Satan sort of messes with us that way too. When things are going well, something's going to be at the reminder. Uh, and again, but we know there are numerous people, there are numerous benefits that you have read uh, that happens when you forgive. You know, there's lower blood pressure, lower uh, stress is reduced, there's less hostility. Uh, these are only some of them. A lower heart rate, fewer depression sy- symptoms, fewer uh, anxiety symptoms, more friendships, healthier friendships. And that's just a few of the, of the benefits of forgiveness. You know, so why wouldn't we? Because when we harbor it in, it wreaks havoc on us spiritually as well as physically. Forgiveness is not tolerating. We are not letting the person get away with it. If they don't make restitution, trust me, the Lord will deal with him or her and in their own time. You know, criminal behavior uh, that is unacceptable, even though you forgive somebody, there still may be consequences that they're going to have to go through the system. You're not freeing them from their consequences. You're just letting go of the grip that it has, that it has on your life. And forgiving is not reconciling. There may be times when reconciliation relationally is just absolutely impossible. So you can forgive somebody 
and legitimately forgive them and yet realize that, you know what, I'm just not going to be able to be with this person. And that could be because they've, everything from uh, they've passed on, they've moved on, to where it's just not a healthy relationship. It's like when we talked about a, a few months ago or weeks ago, I don't know when it was, when you get a text, sometimes you just need to delete the person, block them. Uh, you need to not have the relationship with them. And you are in control of that. If it is an unhealthy relationship, you can forgive them, but it doesn't mean you have to keep putting yourself there and being a doormat uh, for their behavior. People, John is telling the church, he and he is telling us that we need to move from darkness to light, even in the situations that cause us deep pain. That we cannot let the darkness overtake the light. John is not telling us to, to hide our pain. He's just telling us to deal with it. And we deal with it as we, uh, as we uh, extend the gift of forgiveness, which is really for ourselves. So that our lives can move on, so God can use us for his glory, and then God can deal with the offender in the way that God sees best. And dealing with that offender is above all of our pay grades. We'll leave that to God. And God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, people, yeah, you know, two, two difficult things. It's like, oh, you know, love and forgiveness, and they go hand in hand. Uh, but that's what God calls us to. That's what makes us different. We got to do the, the hard work. So why not that we just get along here, but that the world may know that he has sent us. And so we're going to be able to respond today. And, and you can respond by giving uh, financially. That's what we call an offering. If you're our guest, do not feel obligated. Unless the Lord really moved you and you want to give, that is your call. But it's not for our guests. It's for those who call New Life their home. To say, here, Lord, use this money so that new life can be new life uh, for the city. You can respond by, by uh, sharing the communion up front or in the back. We'll have a rover come around if you can't get out of your chair to remind you of, of the forgiveness that Christ has given you that was expressed in the cross. You can, you can go and light a candle up front or again in the back to say, Lord, uh, your light, I need your light to help me. I, remind me that I need to extend forgiveness. On the back, we have a, a board uh, for forgive. As you can see, we keep adding to this one here, but the word is forgive. And, and maybe you just need to write the person's name. Don't put their last name in case they're here in the, in the room here. But maybe it's a name, maybe it's a situation that you wanna write, Lord, uh, Lord, I need your forgiveness for this. And then it's just part of the process that will help you to, to remember the love of God and the forgiveness that, you, that he gave to you and then you can give to others. So let us uh, continue to worship and may you be blessed uh, as uh, the team leads us through these, these next few songs. <laughs>